What's up, sunshine? It's time to shine. Welcome to CNN 10. It's Friday. Rise up. I'm your host, Coy Wire. Let's get dominating this day with the best 10 minutes in news. We've got everything covered this week, right? From worker strikes to royal visits in Kenya to AI. But we start today with news regarding the ongoing war between Israel and Hamas, looking further into how the world is responding this time on some college campuses in the U.S. where tensions are running high. Some students have been holding rallies rallies, vigils, and protests to voice their feelings about this war. Some are pro-Israeli, the nation where at least 1,400 people were killed when Hamas attacked on October 7th. Others are pro-Palestinian. In the ongoing counterattacks by Israel, nearly 10,000 Palestinians have been killed in Gaza, the area where Hamas is based. Many students, regardless of their stance, are attempting to condemn violence overall. While largely peaceful, some student groups have erupted into fighting at colleges, including North Carolina Chapel Hill, Indiana University, and Tulane University. Because of competing protests at Columbia University, administrators temporarily closed campus on Thursday. The universities have been the centerpiece of demonstrations throughout the years, notably as students fought for civil rights in 1960s and protested U.S. involvement in the Vietnam War in the 1970s. The First Amendment gives students and everyone the right to express themselves, stating that no laws can restrict, quote, freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble, unquote. Throughout the years, though, the Supreme Court has stated that that protection has limits and does not include inciting violence. On Tuesday at Cornell University, a student was arrested for allegedly threatening to harm Jewish students in an online post, and the student has been charged in federal court. Well, Cornell closed on Friday, telling CNN this was meant to ease the stress that's been felt in the past weeks. Some Jewish students have told CNN that they're seeing an increase in anti-Jewish action and hatred, which is referred to as anti-Semitic. Anti-Semitism has long been a problem on college campuses, and in a survey done in March, over half of Jewish students responded saying they'd witnessed or experienced an anti-Semitic incident. At the same time, however, advocacy groups like the Council on American-Islamic Relations and the Anti-Defamation League say Muslim people throughout the country have also been the target of increasing harassment and attacks, the type of which are referred to as Islamophobic. President Biden, who has voiced his administration's support of Israel, has now stated that his administration will also work on a first-ever strategy to combat anti-Muslim sentiment. College administrators are tasked with attempting to ease tensions on campuses while also expressing support for their student bodies and their rights. Many colleges have released statements about the war in the Middle East, but some of those responses have incited further protest. Some universities are choosing to refrain from weighing in at all. That has come with some criticism as well. We'll continue to keep you updated on this issue right here on CNN 10. It's about that time for daylight saving time. This first Sunday in November, we will fall back or turn our clocks back an hour or our smartphones will do it for us. So do we gain an hour of sleep or lose an hour? Well, if you usually get up at 6 a.m., you're now going to be getting up at what would have been 7 a.m. So yes, we will gain an hour of sleep. Hallelujah. <laughs> On the first Sunday in March, we spring forward or set our clocks forward an hour. Daylight saving time has been used for more than a century. It was enacted to help us make more use of the day's light. But a Monmouth University poll found most Americans want to stop recognizing it altogether. Some doctors even say the clock change isn't healthy and can cause headaches in some of us by affecting the hypothalamus in the brain, the part that manages our circadian rhythm. The circadian rhythm helps all living things adapt and respond to light and dark within a 24-hour span. 10 second trivia. If you're visiting a loch in Scotland, what are you visiting? A castle, a bridge, a lake, or a school? Ding, 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 ding. Answer is a lock. That's a lake or large body of water surrounded by land. For today's story, getting a 10 out of 10, we're headed to Scotland to check up on a tale of a monster named Nessie and a lock named Ness. Here's CNN's Max Burnell with more. Scotland's Loch Ness has long been shrouded in mystery. 
With reports of monsters lurking in its inky depths dating back to ancient times, it came to the world's attention in the 1930s with a string of reported sightings and an iconic photo. And while it has turned out to be one of many hoaxes, monster hunters and curious tourists alike have continued to flock here ever since. Now, after more than 90 years of fascination, they can visit a new $1.9 million centre dedicated to all things Loch Ness Monster. While those wanting to take a closer look can take a trip on the Deep Scan research vessel, its skipper Alistair Matheson has spent the last 10 years giving visitors and researchers their best chance of spotting Nessie. We have been working in recent years out here. We've done a few big projects. One of those projects involved mapping the bottom of Loch Ness. Now, we were using some very clever equipment. And using that equipment, I can confirm to you all, we did, in fact, find the Loch Ness Monster. This is the very monster we found here. Well, not quite, not quite, I'm afraid, because, because, it turned out it was this. So it was actually built for a movie. But back in the real world, we're going to sail out into the middle of the loch. You will get to see the size of Loch Ness. It's fairly big, of course. Loch Ness is 23 miles long, but on average, it's only a mile wide and it's deep as well. So right now we are 226 metres deep and 227 is maximum depth. Big red dot, that's going to be our monster. In 10 years that I've been doing this, three times on the Echo Sounder, I've seen the big red dot. That would be my closest encounter with a monster. Between 2018 and 2019, the deep scan helped conduct a DNA survey of the lock. While the large amounts of eel DNA it found pointed to a more terrestrial explanation, it didn't deter monster hunter Alan McKenna from organising the biggest creature hunt for 50 years back in August. But the lack of concrete evidence over the years has done little to dampen the mystery for many. Definitive proof is always what we want, isn't it? We always want to know yes or no in everything about life, not just monsters. But for me, there's a mystery here and that's what I firmly believe in. All right, it has been so nice learning with you this week and laughing and having some fun. Halloween was epic. My family were witches. Black cats and I was the magic broomstick carrying the tiny witches on the candy hunt. And how about these costumes? Paul from Mr. Nafis's class in Boston Spa, New York, looking mighty fierce, I have to say. And dad, Mr. Rispo, uh, rocking the Roman Reigns look. Or how about the Firewolves, Miss Seamers, and Mrs. Stottlemyre at Tumwater in Washington. Now that's a 10 out of 10. Thanks to all of you. We've officially reached 800,000 subscribers on our YouTube channel. So now I can do two shout outs at the end of every YouTube version of the show. Today's shout outs go to Belmont High School, Decatur, Indiana. We see you. And Cheney Middle School in West Fargo, North Dakota. Rise up. Have a great weekend, everyone. And remember, you are more powerful than you know. I'm Koi. This is CNN 10. It's been a blessing to spend this week with you.